All right, guys, here we are. And we're actually going to conclude our discussion on ethics proper um, with this discussion on virtue theory. Um, then our next video, our last actual video, will be something more on, more a look at a more applied uh, type ethic, or an, an applied ethical position, rather. Um, but as mentioned, we're going to begin this, this uh, discussion on virtue theory. Now, thus far, we've gone through moral relativism, we've gone through utilitarianism, we've gone through divine command theory, we've gone through natural law, we've gone through uh, <clears throat> a consideration of other you know, things here and there as we've discussed these particular ethical theories. And now we're coming to look at one of the oldest um, and, and, and one of the more traditional uh, ethical theories um, that we have. And again, this is not to say that uh, the others aren't grounded in a, in a very rich, uh, long uh, intellectual history. It's just to say that this, this particular ethical theory, virtue theory, also shares um, that aspect. Um, and it's also one that is old and has this 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 older ancient uh, historic representation, but that is actually found in uh, everyday common experience um, among grandmothers and uh, mothers and fathers and, and and just ordinary folk, so to speak. Now, we did say that that was similar in, in, as it pertained to natural law theory, um, meaning that if, 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 if a theory like that's true, then everyone's already using it anyway. But this is more, it, it's, it's true in this sense, in regard to virtue theory, in the sense that most people are actually appealing to something like virtue theory um, in their everyday lives. Not only do they, are they not living this, if it's true in some sense, but they also know that they're uh, appealing to this type of ethical theory. Of course, I don't mean to, I don't, I'm not saying that they know that they're talking about virtue theory, but they know uh, the very concept, uh, the very principle um, of virtue theory when they, when they go about, about their lives, and this will become um, easily identifiable. Uh, to you just with the very first couple of, uh, of points that we make uh, here in the slides. So, with that said, our big overview here is that virtue theory is a teleological theory. Now remember, when we said teleological, remember it has something like a goal in mind, right? There's already a goal in mind, um, an end result uh, type of goal. Uh, that the, the uh, proponent is looking for as they consider ethical choices. But remember, this is like natural law theory in the sense that it's not just talking about the consequences like utilitarianism. It's talking about the consequences, just that there's a purpose. So it means it's teleological in the sense of goal or purpose, not just a blind, naked, end result type goal. Um, that we're just equivocating there on the word goal. So, virtue theory is a teleological theory that concerns itself with the character and development of the individual in question. So, pay attention here, this is key. That is, one is not simply a person performing right or wrong actions, but more substantially, the person is transformed into a certain sort of thing that desires or just does the good based upon their character. It is concerned with a good life. So let's let's think about this for a moment. Let's cash that out. If you recall, we've gone through the the, the other uh, ethical systems, and they all seem to have some sort of aside from natural law. Um, so let me go ahead and just give this quick caveat. This is related to natural law. So just as Aristotle was a proponent um, of, of natural law theory, he is also uh, one of the, the oldest uh, proponents of this particular theory, virtue theory. So natural law theory and virtue theory aren't necessarily in contrast. 
um, with one another. It's not as if you've got utilitarianism on one hand and you've got uh, constantology on this hand. You know, they stand in total contrast to one another. Um, you know, uh, even, of course, invented, so to speak, uh, proposed by different individuals. Virtue theory is literally um, proposed by the exact same person who also proposed, um, or one of the same people that proposed natural law theory. So virtue theory and natural law theory can coincide with one another. In fact, obviously Aristotle thought they did uh, coincide with one another. If you recall, remember natural law theory, if you've, if you've forgotten, go back and look at that lecture, but if you recall, remember natural law theory was uh, we find out the end goal or the end purpose for the most part in observing the nature or essences of things and then observe, or, or observing particulars and then abstracting the nature of, and essences of things from those uh, particular instances. And then by knowing the nature, the essence of the thing, the formal cause of the thing, the final cause of the thing, that helps us to realize what the thing is for, remember its purpose. So virtue theory coincides with that and so it says well, we realize the nature, the essence of a thing, and so now uh, we try to to find the balance between that, to bring out the virtue um, of, of what of the, the, the balance, the, the golden mean, as we'll talk about, the, the middle ground, so to speak, of two extremes of, of, of what this thing is for. But that's ahead. Don't worry yourself about that now. Right now, all you need to be concerned with this is this, is this overview, that virtue ethics is not necessarily concerned with these rules and regulations and what do I do in any and every exact instance. Virtue theory is seriously uh, looking for the kind of person, the kind of character uh, that just a, the good, quote unquote, the good person is. So it's about becoming. It's very concerned with becoming this certain sort of thing, this certain sort of person. Um, it's concerned with, with developing the character of that person so that when that person, so when the virtuous person is in a certain context, when the virtuous person is in a certain scenario, when the virtuous person is in a certain situation, then the virtuous person just does the good thing that ought to be done in that situation. So you say, well, what is that thing? We don't know. Virtue can, again, virtue theory is not <clears throat> about trying to find out the mathematical, if we could use that term loosely, rules, so to speak, so that if you find yourself in situation B, you perform action X. Um, it's not about that. It's that if the virtuous person finds himself in situation B, what would the virtuous person do there? And so if this person is cultivating the virtues, if this person is cultivating the, the, the good life, um, living the good life, um, in contrast to what that means now, if this person is virtuous, in other words, then they will do the right thing based upon their character as virtuous uh, in and of itself. So what do I mean when I say two things? the good life, and what do I mean when I say that everyone is appealing to this in some, in, uh, in some sense overtly, implicitly, or not implicitly, but explicitly appealing to this. Remember, your grandmother or your mother or your father, and you yourself if you have children, you don't just want your kids to do this one or right thing in this particular action, to follow these specific rules. Your parents have told you this, your mentors have told you this, you may even tell this to your children, is that you want your kids, your parents wanted you to be a certain type of person, right? Not just a person that's able to figure out the math problems in regards to moral conundrums, but they wanted you to grow up to be a certain kind of person, right? They wanted you to grow up to turn into the kind of thing, right, that just enjoys doing the good. They wanted you to be a good, let's, let's say it that way, and I mean this in the most robust sense possible. They wanted you to, to come to be a good person, right? Not just that you just did the right thing, you know, in a certain situation, but that you actually were in and of yourself. Your very, your very being just was a good person, right? And so if you have kids, 
It's the same in the sense that you want your kids to just be this type of person, this kind of thing. And so when we tell our kids this, you know, I've even told my own children recently, look, when I want you to grow up, I, the reason I'm disciplining you, the reason I'm doing these things with you right now is because I want you to grow up to be a good man. I want you to be grow up to be a good woman. This is what you're talking about is virtue theory. You're not just, you may not know what they're going to do in some cer certain situation, but you're trusting that they'll be a, the kind of person that does the right thing in that situation. And this is what virtue theory is concerned about. Now look at this last line in, in, in the notes right here on your slide the good life, right? So the good life now means something like, you know, bikinis and, and, and beer and boats, you know, <laughs> you're living the good life. No, for the ancients, um, for the ancient, for the classical philosophers, the good life was not um, beers, boats, and bikinis. It was the good life meant that you were, again, this good, per that you were a thing that does the good, right? So the good life now is something like pleasure, like hedonism. The good life for them was not necessarily pleasure, not against pleasure per se, but not necessarily pleasure or hedonism, but the good, right? You're living the good. You're doing the good, right? It's not just about acquiring a bunch of this, that, or the other. Now, again, as we've already mentioned, virtue theory has these very classical roots, very ancient um, very classical, um, again, well over 2,000 years old. Um, deep roots in both Plato and Aristotle, um, as we've already mentioned. Of course, as well as others, even you know Thomas Aquinas, um, you know, of course, centuries after these two, but also uh, a proponent of virtue theory. And again, remember Thomas Aquinas, if you recall, is also a proponent of natural law theory. So we have to remember that we're not trying to juxtaposed, say, something like virtue theory with natural law. But these would, again, according to even those thinkers, those proponents, they both um, argued for both of them, right? So they coincide. Now, this, 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 this particular theory, uh, as you can see easily here, it also pans across various uh, traditions, um, cultures, um, religious views, uh, you, you, You've got just all, it runs the gamut as to who adopts this sort of view, this, this, this kind of, this concept of, of being a certain kind of person. Now, again, it may not be as deep, um, or I should say that is to say that it may not be as deep or as, as rigorous or as uh, detailed in various cultures. Um, but there is some sense that, that, that pans across um, all sorts of people groups um, that reveals the, this, this core truth about people being concerned with being a certain kind of person as they get older, not just performing um, certain equations to make sure you do the right thing. Now, let's go ahead and look at a few of these appeals. But before we do that, let's elaborate just a bit more. Let's go back. Let's just elaborate a bit more on virtue theory in and of itself. Now, in some ways, this is going to be similar to natural law in that so many people are appealing to it uh, in some way or the other. Of course, this one a little bit more explicitly. Um, but <clears throat> it's also difficult to, to attain or to explain because it has become and even was uh, so detailed in, say, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, um, where he goes over uh, many of these concepts of virtue theory. But the virtue theory in and of itself was looking at either someone virtuous, right? Say like, for instance, even in the Christian tradition, you see the What Would Jesus Do bracelets, right? The WWJD bracelet, the slogan. Well, that is virtue theory put into practice. So what someone is trying to do there is look at the virtuous person, in this case, uh, for the Christian, it would be uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And they would look at Jesus, they would find themselves in a certain situation, and they would ask themselves, well, what would he do? What would this, this, this uh, paradigm of virtue do in this particular instance? And then what? They would try to emulate 
um, behavior that the, birth, the, that the virtuous person would perform in that situation. So that's at least one way um, in which virtue theory uh, would be carried out. Now, the other and the more detailed explanation of that would be what's called the golden mean, right? So someone like Aristotle would say, you've got these two extremes on virtually all uh, positions, not necessarily all. So, so for instance, mur murder would always be wrong. But you've got these... You've got these two extreme positions. Let's say, in, in one of the classic examples is, on this extreme you have cowardice, right? On this end of the spectrum you have cowardice. And on this extreme you have something like foolhardiness or rashness, right? Well, the virtue uh, that is to be uh, habituated, and I'll explain what that means, but the virtue that is to be put into practice in that instance, is what? What do you think that the virtue would be? What would be the, the golden mean, as, again, the classic verbiage is there? What would be the golden mean between um, something like rashness on the one hand, foolhardiness, and cowardice uh, on the other hand? What would be the golden mean? What is the perfect middle um, uh, ground there? Well, in this case, Aristotle and virtue theorists would argue that the golden mean in that case would be something like bravery, right? You're not, it's not cowardice, yet at the same time it's not just running in the headlong into danger, um, ir, you know, regardless of the consequences, regardless of the outcome, but a, 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 a reasoned approach to a, a brave action in that instance, so braveness. So the golden mean between cowardice and rashness is something like bravery. Right, a proper understanding of bravery. Now, another another classical example might be something like, well, what is the golden mean between <laughs> and rhymes, right? It's not there we go. So, what is the golden mean between something like uh, just stinginess, right? Just a, a miser, right? Just a, a penny pincher in, in the sense of, of of being just radically stingy, and just wastefulness, right? Just extravagance, right? What is the golden mean between those two? Um, Aristotle would say is something like uh, just a proper understanding of generosity, right? Meaning that the virtue there, the virtuous person there is generous in that situation, right? He's neither stingy, he or she is neither stingy in the situation, and he or she is neither uh, uh, just wasteful or abs or just just wastefully extravagant um, just silly in their in their use of their their money or, or, the, or whatever it is that, that may be required in that instance but the golden mean rather is uh, generosity so it's this search for again the golden mean right the, 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 this 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 I don't want to say compromise because that's somewhat pejorative but let's just use that term right now, but don't think of it in its negative connotations. But a compromise between these two extremes, right? The, the, the perfect, the golden, uh, the perfect middle ground there between these two extremes. Now, again, someone might say, like, well, there's, you know, some things, there is no extreme between, like murder is just always wrong. But really, when you think about it, even that could possibly be argued as an extreme of two positions. So, let, for sake of argument, let's just say that murder would be the innocent, the killing of an innocent human being, right? And the other extreme would be never uh, killing a, a human being, right? Mur on one sense, you've got killing of innocent human beings, which just is murder. That's an extreme. And then you've got the other where you never kill anyone. Well, the middle ground might be, and this, again, this is just for sake of argument, that you would only kill someone who is who is uh, threatening to kill or is in the process of harming, say, children or, or other innocent individuals, something like that. Again, whether you hold to that or not, that's neither here nor there. That's just us looking at whether or not there's some sort of uh, position, middle ground, even between those two, a uh, position that uh, some might say, well, murder, there's no in-between that. That's always wrong. Well, 
the question is, well, is that rather one of the two extremes? Is murder just itself one of the two extremes? Um, and, there, and there has to be a middle ground um, in that instance. Now, Aristotle would say, too, and many virtue theorists would say, that you don't just... How do we word this? You don't just, you're not just born um, necessarily with this perfect ability to, to perform virtuously, to live a virtuous life, to live out the virtues. And this is, again, one of those intuitive aspects of, 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 of an ethical theory that, that many of us appeal to, whether we know it or not. And, it, and it's this idea of habituation, meaning... Aristotle would say that this has to become a habit, um, that you become a virtuous person, again, not just because you're, 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 you're born that way, that you can just do it uh, intrinsically, um, just on your own. Um, rather, you have to find out what the virtue is in some situation, some circumstance based upon reason, right? The reason of, 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 of the golden mean there um, through the rational process of finding out that golden mean and, and slash or both and emulating the virtuous person and putting that into practice over and over and over and over and over so that you start to literally become because, as, because, uh, because as out, out of habit, you become this sort of person that when you do find yourself in a situation that requires you, say, to be uh, generous, to take one of our earlier examples, that you find yourself, again, not just saying, all right, what should I do in this situation? All right, I should be generous. Here's the moral precept for that. And then you just go about it. But that you become the person, you just be literally in the most Robust sense possible, you literally just become a what? See if you can put these pieces together. When, when, when the virtuous person finds himself in a situation that calls for generosity, he just is what? He just is generous, right? He's not even necessarily at this point because he's been putting this habit into practice for so long. And again, this is for all the virtues. That he's been putting these, these, these principles into play for so long, these, these virtues into play for so long in his life through the act of habit, through the act of discipline, that he no longer even knows necessarily that he's having to conform to some moral rule, but he's literally just becoming, she's just becoming a generous person. It's literally, and this is what virtue, virtue theory is after, it's becoming her very character to be virtuous, or rather, to be generous. And virtuous, of course, to be virtuous, but specifically what we're talking about here is generous. So that this person is literally just becoming not just a person who sees a situation that calls for generosity and then puts that into practice, but a person who just in their very character is generous, right? And so you can apply any of the virtues here in that regard and say the same thing, that when a certain person finds themselves in a situation that calls for empathy, that they just are in their very character empathetic, that they just are in their very character loving, that they just are in their very character uh, encouraging, that they just are in their very character generous, that they just are in their very character brave, right? Because they're, they've, they're literally just turning into, again, this, this metamorphosis from a caterpillar almost to a butterfly through habit, through putting the virtues into practice, through emulating, vir emulating virtuous people, that they just turn into this person. So in other words, we could even look, look at this as something like character um, development or soul development, that their soul is being transformed into this particular thing. Their character just is being transformed into this particular thing. Which leads into our first appeal, right? So the first appeal of this kind of system would be to say that it's it's here it is just number one. It seems like it's there's less quote unquote drudgery than say something like Kant's deontology. You can actually you can actually turn into you can actually become the the sort of thing the sort of person that enjoys that just wants to do 
um, the quote unquote right thing or the good thing, that you just become that. Um, and right, there does seem to be some appeal to this, right? There does seem to be some appeal that, wait a minute, is there a system that I don't, you know, I, I just don't have to uh, ask myself what, you know, what moral precept am I supposed to put into play here? Or imagine, again, going through Kant's deontology. Does this create a contradiction? I need to do this just out of duty. Um, you know, whether I like it or not, i got to do it. Um, you know, that sort of thing. Or would it be, is it appealing to say that, I, man, it's not even necessarily a chore or a burden to me anymore to do the right thing because I've just turned into the sort of thing, I've just turned into the sort of person um, that enjoys doing the right. My, my character is being developed or my character has been developed. Um, to where that I'm enjoying doing the right, that I'm just doing the good um, for because I just, that's who I am, right? In fact, we've always heard, we hear people say that on the news, you know, uh, so-and-so, you you know, your son gave his life or your next-door neighbor gave his life for the little girl across the street in the house fire. He ran in and just and rescued her, rescued her with no thought or concern for himself and, and saved her life. And someone may say, well, you know, that's just the kind of person he was. He was just that, that's just who, that's just who he was. Well, when they give that kind of answer, they're appealing to virtue theory. They're saying that his character just was that. He just was that type of thing. That in that situation, he would do that, right? He didn't have to go through a moral, again, moral equation of some sort, but he just was that sort of thing. Um, they're just appealing to virtue theory there. They're just saying that he had that kind of character. He was just a person that just did that, regardless of, of whatever else was going on. Now, the second appeal, well, and let's just say this about the first again. I think there's something to this. I think that there really is something that is, again, with this, this is as an appeal, I think that there just is, there really is something appealing, um, almost even freeing to know that you can become a certain type of person and that your moral life right is not only constrained by uh, you know abstract considerations of, of right or wrong but that you really can turn into this sort of thing I think there's a I think there's a strong appeal to that at least there is to me now this is also uh, an a theory or our second uh, appeal here a theory that is extremely attractive to both religious and some non-religious observers so just as there is this appeal in some of the other uh, ethical systems this seems to have an appeal to various worldviews meaning um, that one doesn't have to necessarily call themselves secular or one doesn't have to necessarily call themselves a a theist of some sort um, to find some sort of appeal, um, some sort of truth that seems there, there's something that just rings true about this uh, this particular theory um, to many people, regardless of what their uh, overall outlook is, right? Their overall worldview, whether they're religious or non-religious. Now, I threw, went ahead and threw this in here, this appeal. Um, it seems to align with com the common intuition that laws have lawgivers. Now, if there is a certain sort of way that we should act, um, and there is a certain sort of character, I, really I put it in for this reason here, or this makes, I should say this makes more sense, is that if there really is this character development, if there really is this person or this thing which you can become, right, from caterpillar to butterfly sort of thing, then this, at the very least, seems to have some sort of some sort of implication that there is a purpose to again um, law or law giving, so to speak. Um, I'll let you kind of I'll, I'll let you kind of think on that. You can push either do it now, push pause, and just just ruminate on that for a moment. And I think you'll come to see what we're saying here. Um, or you can just continue and try to jot down a note. Maybe you'll remember this later. Um, but we'll check that out in a, in a few. Um, or you can pause and, and ruminate on that in a few. 
Now, we're going to look look at one of the one of the first objections to this, is, and we start to get into objections to this ethical theory. Again, with all of them, there seem to be objections, right? Um, one of the, the the most serious objections to this particular ethical theory. Um, we're starting off with one of the big guns here. I know that we've we've kind of in the past waited, so to speak, to hold off on some of the big ones towards the end. But this one, we're going to start off with one, one of the, the big objections. It goes something like this: Is that what if, or is it possible that when someone's thinking about the virtuous person, when someone is considering what he or she ought to be in regards to their character development, um, becoming this good kind of person, becoming this generous person, becoming this brave um, person, becoming this loving or empathetic or encouraging person, whatever the virtue is in that, in that instance. Is one really considering others in this moral decision-making process, or does it really turn out to be self-centered? Think about that. Push pause if you need to. Is, is someone really, when they're like, oh, well, I want to be a certain kind of person, you know, or, um, you know, I want to be the kind of person that just is brave. I just want to, I want to be the kind of person that just is um, generous. I just want to be the kind of person that is these sorts of things. Is it really, when you're think, making those considerations, when you're trying to become the virtuous person, is it really ever about the other individual? Meaning, are you, is, your, is this moral theory actually taking other people, other than yourself, into consideration here? Um, or does it seem like being the virtuous person is just all about making you a better person? Well, if it's just all about making you a better person, how is that have, how is that, in the rich sense of the word, morality, because it seems like morality and doing the right thing is about other people, right? Not just about you and what you get out of it, but about other folks, right? About others. It seems that mor morality, the ethical considerations, force us to be other con uh, uh, con concerned uh, with others. That there's others that are at the core of our moral considerations. Well, I, you know, think about this. Again, like, I ought not. Um, let's go back to the example of, of, of murder. Well, I ought not murder because that person, they have intrinsic value in and of themselves, and it would be wrong for me to harm that person. As opposed to his virtue say, virtue theory saying, well, I shouldn't murder someone because that is the is, is one of the two extreme positions that I need to avoid so that I will be a virtuous person. You see the difference there? The first says, well, I shouldn't murder this person over here because that person is a, has intrinsic value in and of themselves, and I shouldn't bring harm to other people. And virtue theory seems to be saying that, well, I shouldn't murder, murder, murder other people because that would make me an unvirtuous person. You see how the moral consideration seems to be backwards there? It seems like that some would, would argue, some object to virtue theory saying that virtue theory is really self-centered. It's just all about making me the virtuous person for the sake of my own um, end goal of being a virtuous person and it never really has anything to do with um, the other, right? Now, just something to think about here is that, but what if one believes that he should be a certain thing because it is exactly that sort of thing that will be for the good of our others, right? Meaning, is there something in virtue theory that says, well, yes, you should become this sort of thing because that's just what's good for society. The best thing you can do for society, the best thing that you can do for others is being this sort of thing, right? Being this virtuous person because in turn, that just is the best thing for others. Because guess what? You won't be murdering others if you were becoming this sort of virtuous person. So if you're becoming this, this virtuous person, then that just is the best thing for those other people. Now, that's an argument that can be uh, going back and forth. Some might say, well, yeah, but still at the end of the day, it's still about you. Some might say, no, because there's there's there seems to be in Aristotle this 
that seems to be the implication that it's about the good of society, the good about the others, um, the, the good for uh, the city-state in this specific uh, example. Again, I'll leave you guys to um, just wrestle through that, see what you think about that uh, consideration, but I at least wanted to, uh, again, toss out that because it's one of, one of the strongest objections, but two, that there's a response to that objection that you may be able to wrestle through, um, especially if you go back to some of our text here, um, or even the writings that we may have offered here with uh, in regards to Nicomachean ethics to see if Aristotle is, is implicitly trying to say this, right? That, well, no, that the good is for the society. Like we, we abstract that from the natural law, and then this is the best way to do that. It's the best thing we can do for others is to be virtuous. Anyway, again, I'm going to let you investigate that further. You can even uh, maybe encapsulate that or, or, or uh, incorporate that, I should say, into one of your assignments. Now, one of the next objections is, I'll just read it first here, is, but in the moment, what do I actually do, right? Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, it, it's, this objection looks at something like, all right, let's say that I get in this situation, I have some sort of moral consideration that I'm, that I'm supposed to be, um, you know, I'm supposed to perform, I'm supposed to do something, uh, in this, in this, in this scenario, in this, in this context, in this moral context, this moral circumstance here, and virtue theory doesn't give me anything to do. Like, what do I do, right? Um, so, in fact, I've even heard it said this way. Somebody might say, "Well, when you get in the situation and say, well, what would Jesus do, right?" They're going off the earlier example of the "What would Jesus do?" bracelet, the WWJD thing. Somebody might say, "Well, that's exactly the problem. What would he do? We don't know, right? We, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Am I supposed to?" Uh, maybe give this person tough love or am I supposed to not allow them to experience um, the consequences of their actions, right? What am I supposed to actually do? There's no principle that helps me, uh, that gives me any sort of guide, so to speak, um, that when I get in a situation that I can actually know what I'm supposed to do in that situation other than this poetic concept of being a virtuous person in that situation. So, for instance, they may even say something like, all right, well, you say I'm supposed to put these into habit, right? Well, well how do I know when to put that particular virtue into practice? That's exactly what I'm trying to figure out is how to be the virtuous person, but I don't know when to put the thing into practice, right? You say make it a habit, but when do I do that? How do I do it, right? Now, Again, this is another consideration that we have to look back into our primary texts and or even our secondary texts here and say, well, wait a minute, is there something there that's implicitly stating, well, no, this just is, the vir these virtues, these habits, these, these, uh, these, this emulating the virtuous person just is what you do uh, in that situation. Um, another response to that, some people would say, well, that, that objection completely, completely misses the mark because virtue theory just never was about, like, what, again, what do I do, but becoming a certain sort of person. So that question solves itself, so to speak, in the situation when you uh, approach, when you come to that bridge, if you just are the virtuous person. Again, you can see how both of those, would, there's immediate replies to both of those types of responses. Um, but I'm going to let you wrestle again through that. Again, if possible, you can incorporate that into your assignment. Now, this is more one of this is possibly one of the, the more modern versions of, of of or excuse me, modern objections to virtue theory, and that is that calling good presupposes a prior notion of good, um, and this is similar to deontology. So you could even uh, one of your objections to deontolo deontological ethic is that. You could even say calling so and so good, right? So if you so if, if you wanted to emulate Aristotle, right, or if you wanted to emulate Jesus, or if you wanted to emulate whatever, um, they would say that calling blank that person presupposes a prior notion of good, um, which is just exactly what you're supposed to be figuring out, right? But if you already know what the virtuous person is doing, then you don't need to emulate the virtuous person. You can just do the 
whatever the virtuous person would do because you already know it. Now, in my view, I'm not necessarily convinced that that's a very strong objection um, because, again, as you see here, that seems just in relate, like the deontological thing. This, is, this seems to confuse uh, moral epistemology with moral ontology, meaning the how do you know what's, if something is good or not with the grounding um, uh, uh, of whether something is good or not. So it would be kind of like, or it seems like, or, kind of like arguing that, well, if you looked at a map in order to get to Atlanta, well, you already must have some idea of where Atlanta is. But if you already have some idea of where Atlanta is, then you don't need the map. Right? Well, that doesn't follow at all, right? You, you can look at Atlanta and see the map, or excuse me, you can look at the map and see Atlanta, but that doesn't imply that you still don't need the map to actually get to Atlanta. Right, so the same may be argued in regards to you see this person, and in some sense you recognize them as good, but it doesn't. But it still doesn't follow that you might not need to examine that person just as you would the map in order to see what you may do in the situation. Again, these objections I'm going to allow you to wrestle through, to think through on your own in some sense. Again, remember this is philosophy. That's the whole point, um, especially in regard to ethical theories, is to wrestle through, think through some of these conclusions. And again, let's rely on our text, some of our text uh, material here to, to help us uh, get through some of this. But again, very interesting stuff. Uh, again, even just when you find yourself riding down the road, you know, working out, doing your, riding your bike, whatever, um, grocery shopping, whatever, just to wrestle through some of these, uh, these objections and some of these appeals, uh, see where you come to in regard to these conclusions. Now, one of the other objections is this, is, 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 it's said that virtue theory has some of the same problems that other, uh, some of these other ethical theories have in regards to moral dilemmas. Um, so if the virtuous person finds himself in a situation where he, to use one of our examples from a prior lecture, if he finds himself in a moral dilemma, like you know he promises his wife and his children that he will not miss his, uh, his dinner with them again after repeated misses for various reasons, and he gives them his word he won't, then he sees a child drowning um, in a pond on the way home from work. Um, well, what does the virtuous person do in that situation? Does the virtu virtuous person solve or help the child or keep his promise to his, his, his family, his spouse, his children? Um, so again, some would say that the virtue theory has a problem with moral dilemmas. What does the virtuous person do there, right? Now, one response to that might be, or not might be, but just would be that, and I don't want to say it's dismissive, but one of the less strong responses by some virtue theories, virtue theorists, rather, is that, well, those sorts of situations are so involved with complex moral solutions that they don't take into account just everyday practical moral decisions that everyone makes, which do rely heavily on or, or, or what virtue theory does speak heavily to. Now, again, that is in one, one way dismissive, and that's not the strongest answer that a virtue theorist could give to that. In fact, it's not the strongest answer that virtue theorists um, might give to this objection of moral dilemma. And so what I'm going to ask you is, what is your text or what are your resources that we're using in our class right now? What might they say or what might you say, um, if you'd have to do a little extra investigation there, what might you say? Um, is the virtue theorists, or maybe one of the strongest responses, even if you don't buy into it, what is one of the strongest um, object or, 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 or rebuttals to that objection by the virtue theorists um, that they may give to this charge of that they, they have nothing to say in regards to moral dilemmas. Now, one of our last objections, and this is, again, this is a newer type objection, um, from modern era philosophers, um, even modern era philosophers that uh, take virtue theory seriously, is they might say something like, how can be virtues be truly good when those typically seen as immoral can display these virtues, right? So apparently uh, one particular text that I was reading gives these examples of, of mobsters um, that have this code of ethics. They have like this, basically this mob ten list of Ten Commandments about being honest with one another um, in their dealings, um, not to uh, covet, basically not covet 
another mobster's wife, right? You, that, you, that's taboo. That's forbidden. You cannot uh, jeopardize any your relationship with your spouse with another of your uh, mafia brothers, you know, spouses, and vice versa. That that you can't do that with one another, right? You can't. Their spouses are off limits, and just other things like that. So they're saying, well, wait a minute. How can that actually be good? How can this that how can you actually call something like that these quote unquote virtues good if they can be put into practice by these even, even mafia guys, even mobster guys? Well, I'm not necessarily sure that that's even a great objection because one, it, it, again, just because people are confused on what is or isn't a virtue doesn't mean the virtues don't exist, right? Um, but even also, It seems like the, the more classical objection would just simply be like, well, they're not, they're not consistently applying the virtues, right? So the fact that you say that you're being honest and you're applying the virtue of honesty in regards to your, your the mafia, the, the mob, your, your associates there, well, well, the virtue would be that you're honest across the spectrum, right? That you're honest in your dealings regardless of who you're talking to. So... <laughs> Or who you're dealing with. So, so for instance, again, the objection will go like, well, they they're honest with themselves, but they you know lie to the to the police or whatever. Well, it seems like the classical response would just be is easily like, well, they're not honest, man. You can't you don't get to pick and choose who and where and with who you display the virtues. If you're honest, you're you're honest across the, the board, and that is that is actually having the virtue of honesty, not that you just are honest to those in your mob or those in your gang or whatever. But that you're honest across the board, then you can be. Then it's said that you actually have the virtue of honesty, um, something like that, right? Meaning that again, just sim for simplicity's sake, you don't get to pick and choose where you apply the virtues and then say you have the virtue, right? That they would probably have said it didn't work that way. Um, so I'm not necessarily sure that that last one is, is really a good uh, good objection. But again, you can look at that, detail that out, cash it out even further if need be. Now. Some of our conclusions is that old as it is, ancient as, as it is, even archaic maybe, even though that's slightly, uh, you know, that has negative connotations. Um, so I don't want to necessarily say archaic, but in one sense it is archaic. It's ancient, it's old, it's classic, um, but not negatively so. Um, it's not, even though, even though those things are true, it's not dead uh, as an ethical theory. Um, there are many, even modern philosophers that, completely reject the concept of, or the classical philosophical school of thought, um, specifically the, the Aristotelian Thomistic sort of account um, of, of, of philosophy that still hold to uh, a, a virtue theory. Uh, if I'm correct, even uh, I think someone like a modern philosopher like Martijan uh, espouses something like this. You can look at some of his work, uh, either in your texts or otherwise. Um, so it's not dead. Now, again, one of the questions that we have to look at here is some of the things that we want to take away in conclusion. Some of our takeaways is, one, realize that it's not dead as an ethical theory. Um, one I didn't mention, but I want to go ahead and mention quickly, is just, again, uh, do you feel as if this has some strong intuitive, intuitive is there a, a strong intuitive appeal about this, this ethical theory that we really are using this in some sense, that it, it, there is some grain of truth that there is something true about becoming a certain sort of person and not necessarily concerning yourself with just rules and regulations or whatever, but becoming a sort of person, developing a character. Um, and I didn't mention this, but let me go ahead and mention this, that one of the objections would be there's just no such thing as character. Um, you can look through that if you want. I, I just, I, just to go ahead and admit, put my cards on the table, I don't think, I think that's just false. I think there really does exist something like character that some people are more prone to, all things being equal, certain behaviors than other people are. Um, some of the experiments or, or the objections that I've seen that have tried to argue against that, against the very existence of character, always have extenuating circumstances. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like anybody argue, doesn't argue that, well, extenuating circumstances come into play in making, affecting people's moral decisions, or any decision for that matter. The question is, all things being equal, are they more prone to act this way or act that way? Um, not what the extenuating circumstance di dictates. 
So, again, back to conclusions and takeaways is, do you feel that this virtue theory, again, this is something that we're asking um, in regard to all the ethical theories, do you feel that this, this virtue theory, do you, do you think that it gives you more solutions um, than it does problems? Or do you feel like this just brings up more problems, opens up a ma major can of worms, um, than it does actually give any solutions in regard to how we go about ethical, uh, making ethical decisions or grounding um, ethics, so to speak. Now, one of the things, again, that we've, at, we've had to ask ourselves across the board is, does this account for moral guilt? Um, is this deep enough? Is this robust enough? Is this rich enough to have anything to say in regard to the way we feel when we do something wrong, right? Um, the fact that we lay on our bed at night and, and, and regret, deeply regret, uh, a decision we've, either we've made recently or even in the past, does virtue theory take that into consideration? This concept, this psychological concept of guilt, um, are you laying there and thinking, I shouldn't have done that to that lady because, you know what, now I'm not virtuous, right? <laughs> Um, this virtue theory take that into account or do you have to combine this with another theory um, in order to accommodate this real sense of moral guilt that we experience again to kind of put my cards on the table I'm not ready to dismiss virtue theory um, as an ethical theory but at the same time at least at this point you know philosophers change their mind on things um, at least at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm not ready to accept it um, by itself, right? It, it seems like that there, it does need, at least this is my view, is that it seems like that it needs to be held into combination. So on the one hand, I'm not ready to dismiss virtue theory. In fact, not just not ready, but I don't think we should dismiss virtue theory um, in my view. Um, but again, in my view, it does seem like that there needs to be something in tandem, something that coincides um, along with virtue theory. Um, to account for some of these things that we run into, um, specifically this aspect of guilt. I think this, this, this psychological aspect of guilt, moral guilt that, that we experience, that most, most human beings experience, um, all things being equal, um, I think any ethical theory has to somehow take that into account. Um, I think it has to make sense of that, um, in my view. Um, and ET here doesn't mean extraterrestrial, it means ethical theory. Now, here's some stuff here that, again, you can look, look through for extra. Uh, this is this virtue theory. There's a nice little write-up on the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, uh, which is one of my few recommended Internet resources if you want to look at something on the Internet. Um, also, uh, you don't see it here, but also the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is just another uh, immediately... Uh, available internet resource that I trust that that's that's uh, offers quality material in regard to some of these these theories that we've been talking about uh, even here virtue theory now from a natural law perspective I'll put that in here because this is Ed Faser again um, that you'll recognize this this philosophical or this philosopher's name here is that again I put this in here again because this even in Aristotle's own account even the, even in, in the account of Aquinas Virtue theory and natural law are some, in some way um, tied with one another, um, go with one another in some sense. And so I hope that you've gotten something out of this, uh, our, our discussions properly speaking of virtue theory and our discussions properly speaking um, all of the ethical theories thus far. Now, this is not the last lecture of the course. Um, Almighty willing, this is, but this is the last lecture in regards to the theories in and of themselves that we'll be discussing, the big theories that we've been discussing thus far um, as it pertains to ethics and ethical theories. Some of the things I want you to consider, the last lecture that I want us to talk about will be, again, an applied ethic, um, looking at one specific ethic, uh, moral consideration, and seeing if we can develop an argument for or against a certain position, ethical position, that's popular in our culture, in our day and age. Now, and it'll be a hot button topic. Now, some of the things I want you to consider if, as this, this being the last lecture on the, the ethical theories proper is, which ethical theory did you find 
was most satisfactory in its meta-ethical um, considerations. Which ethical theory did you think could go actually ground the sense of absolute right or wrong, the sense of objective right, this is the sense of objective wrong, that some things just really are wrong, some things are really right, um, good, moral. Um, which theory do you feel like accounts for that, can explain that epistemologically, how do we know it, and which theory grounds it, right? Which theory gives you this rich, um, strong sense of objective morality that doesn't seem arbitrary, that doesn't seem wishy-washy, but there's this real sense of, of objective right and wrong. Another question. Think about, ask yourself, which theory do you feel like explains both, not just the grounding and not just the epistemological question of how we know, but is there a particular theory that explains both of these, right? How we know and that it just is, right? That it is, again, either right or wrong objectively, Absolutely, what, what not, and that we how we know it right. Is there a, is there any of these particular theories that help you uh, bridge these two cons these very important concepts of ontology grounding metaphysic, the metaphysical meta ethical consideration and the epistemological that bring, brings them together nicely. Um, is there an ethical theory that we've discussed that helps you to do that? Um, another consideration. What do you find yourself appealing to uh, most often um, in your ethical world, so to speak, when you're having ethical discussions, when you're uh, discussing this with your children, with your, your family, with your friends, with your, uh, those you disagree with? What do you find yourself appealing to uh, more, most often? And here's the, the philosophical question now. What aspect? of each one do you find yourself appealing to? So you may appeal to one epistemologically, how, how people know right and wrong, but meta-ethically you may be appealing to a different um, theory. Um, and how can you make sense of that? Can you make sense of that using or utilizing either a combination of these ethical theories or just one in particular? Um, what do you do with that? Um, perhaps one of the last considerations might be how would you, if you had to go about explaining these different ethical considerations, these ethical theories, how might you go about doing that? How might you go about explaining to your, your friend, your family, your children, virtue theory? How might you go about explaining moral relativism uh, to someone who is questioning the existence of, of morality and just in general, much less an ethical theory of how to apply them? Um, how do you find yourself explaining a deontological type ethic? divine command type ethic. Um, has this course helped you in that, right? Has this, have these lectures helped you understand these on a deeper level? Um, and has, the, has this, has this course and ethics helped you to, uh, to adopt one view over and over and against another, or realize the, the deficiency in your view, or realize the strength in the view that you maybe, that you already held? Um, just a lot of questions to think about here. Again, maybe you can somehow implement, implement that into your, uh, uh, your assignment. Um, check out your texts you know, that, that, that we've got here for you. Um, do extra research if you need to. Um, but enjoy this. You know, enjoy this. And hopefully I'll see you with our last lecture.